All right, we're going to go ahead and pray it up. So um, let's go ahead and get started here. Our hearts before the Lord. Father God, we come before you and we just want to give you thanks for this opportunity to be able to just come together in a, in a safe environment where we can just come and just lay our everything before you at the foot of the cross and just meet with you, Father. We thank you for the blood that you shed on the cross. We ask you that you would please forgive us and wash us, cleanse us, Father. As we come tonight, that you are uh, that you would be blessed by the worship, Father God, that it would be all about you, Lord Jesus. Father, that you would just open up our hearts and our minds just to receive from you. Father, that you would just bless the study tonight and just help us just to, just to, to hunger and thirst for you more, Father God. We love you and we praise you and we ask for your will to be done here tonight. And we ask all these things in your mighty and precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.
a song by the name of Oceans Where Feet May Fail. And this song God brought to me during a very difficult time. I just use it to just minister to me and my wife. How he's always there. He leads us out to the water. He'll never leave us for sake because he's always there. He's always there.
This uh, song I wanted to introduce. Excuse me. I've heard it before, and wow, God just brought it to me, and it's like first three times I was practicing it, I couldn't play without crying. It's just a beautiful song. It kind of talks about who Jesus is, what He's done for us.
we thank you that you are a friend of sinful man, that you came and shed your, you sent your son to shed his precious blood for us, Father, to wash us clean of our sins. We thank you for what you've done on the cross, Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be poured out here tonight, Father God, that you would just continue to minister to us, help us to grow uh, in faith, Father God, being transformed into your image, Lord Jesus. Father God, help us to love one another as you've called us to, Father. Um, I just thank you for what you've done. I lift up this night to you, um, the teaching, and just pray that your Holy Spirit would just uh, minister to us tonight, Father. We love you and we praise you. We ask all these things in your mighty and precious name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. All right, how's everyone doing tonight? basic series with uh, Francis Chan video, so uh, definitely want you to stay focused on it, and uh, no one wants to get scared when the phone goes off in the dark, so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if, you, uh, if you don't have a pen and paper with you and you want to take some notes and stuff, put your hand up and we have some pen and paper and we'll get out to you guys, and then also if you need a Bible to kind of go over some of the verses you're going with, just raise your hand, we got up here for you as well, and someone will bring them to you, just raise your hands up, if you need them, higher, if you need them. From so high that everybody sees it. Okay, so up here we got a pen and paper Bible. What is the Bible? Pen and paper Bible. Exactly. Alright. So, <laughs> so, November 9th. First of all, the last lounge last Friday was awesome. Um, everybody came together. And uh, that music was phenomenal. The organization was phenomenal. I want to thank Maureen, Charles, and everybody who came out and, and volunteered to help. It was amazing. So, looking forward to next year with the two. And we'll keep you guys updated when the next uh, lounge will be beginning next year, hopefully soon. So, <clears throat> Rummage Sale, November 9th. Donations are welcome until uh, the 7th of November. On November 9th, from 7 a.m. till 2 p.m., we're doing a Rummage Sale here. Inside. It'll be here at the building. Trust me, you'll see the signs. Just come out. And if you're willing to help and you want to help and you want to serve, please just come. Get a hold of. Maureen, Janet, Gina, and Michelle, wherever they are, put your hands up. Get a hold of them, they'll be glad to help you guys and just kind of get us organized. But we definitely do need volunteers, so please, if it's in your heart, come to help and serve. And then uh, also, um, church cleanup day, November 17th, November 16th, sorry. Uh, we're going to meet here at 8 a.m. We're going to do maintenance, cleaning, spring cleaning, winter cleaning, summer cleaning, all the cleaning, and painting, and all the other good stuff. So. If you want to serve, come help. Um, Abe said he'll provide coffee in the morning. When is so that? uh, when is that? that'll be November 16th. Um, and if he's doing that in the morning, I'll provide monsters for the afternoon. So, so just so uh, you guys know. Yeah, I know. I got you. I got I to give a cake just like you. All right. Women's study. Um, they're meeting at Coco's in Upland at 7.30 p.m. on Friday, November 1st. If you have any questions in regards to that, see Maureen. 7.30 p.m. Um, 7.30 p.m. on Friday, November 1st. So just talk to Maureen in regards to it, and then we'll be good with that. Other than that, we're going to go into the Francis Chan series today, and then, um, yes. Uh, we need to say something about the Rummage Sale. Okay. On Friday, um, November 8th, we are going to be here all day to set up for the 9th, because we can't get up early. It's so early. Can we get volunteers to come in here? Anybody who wants to come to the day before. Because we, we need men to, to lift the, the big heavy stuff on that day. I'm all here. All right, so that's also on camera, by the way. Uh, so going forward, here we go. Uh, we all hang out. Join hands. Did you get started? Do you wear the side? 
mai mult schide ce te-a Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, God, and for you are our Father, Lord, and your name is above all names, and your name is so hallowed, Father. We thank you for calling us your own, that we are a part of your family. And Father, I pray that if there's anything that is in our lives that are not of you, that you just give us the strength and the courage to remove it. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit is present here tonight, God, that you just move amongst us, that you just touch our hearts, open up our eyes to truth, Father. May we not just be distracted with things going on in our life, but may we just lay down those things at the cross, trusting that you're in control of our life. Tonight, Lord, we worship you. Our entire life we give to you, God. Our every breath belongs to you. The only reason why, God, that we can even be here this moment is because of you, God. Lord, we just ask you that you're here tonight. And that you just bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please hello to somebody tonight. <laughs> 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 Take it apart and, 
and allow the Bible to interpret itself. And so we've been going over the book or the Gospel of Mark for the past few months. And we come to the point where Jesus Christ, he's baptized, he's out there, he's, he's going into different temples, and he's teaching about what it means to be a true follower of Christ. And there's lots of chaos because Jesus Christ is challenging all these, these high priests. And he's challenging all their thoughts. And it comes to this point where he goes back to Simon Peter's house and he says to his people, what, who is my real family? And we get to this point in, 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 into our, in the Gospel of Mark, he's saying that those that do the will of my Father are my family. Just because you're a part of my flesh, my family means nothing. My true family are those that trust me, follow me, and they do my Father's will. And so we're at, so we, I say, you know what, let me just figure something out, because this is so important, what it means to be part of God's family. A lot of us have been brought up in certain traditions or certain churches where it's either very legalistic or there's, just, there, there, there's no rules whatsoever, and it, it kind of just, there's so many different opinions of what church is and, and you know, how we should live or how we should be as a believer of Christ. And so one of my favorite pastors recently is Pastor Francis Chan. And uh, I'm like, you know what? No one could explain it better, at least in my, uh, uh, for me, than this guy. So rather than me trying to, and to do the skits and do it, like, let me just play his videos. Because ultimately there's, you know, the way he, the way he does is amazing. And so it's a seven part series. And so we've taken apart two parts per day, like 12 to 14 minutes each. And basically he's talking about, rather than, going to church, it's about being the church. And it's called the basic series. It's the basics of what it means to be a true follower. And in there, the very first part is, you have to start with fearing God. You know, in Psalms 111, 110, it says, at the beginning of wisdom, it starts from the fear of the Lord. And so the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so if we don't have a proper understanding of what it means to truly fear God, we're never going to understand anything else. And so Francis Chan goes to these certain segments and shows us from fearing God to following Jesus to the Holy Spirit to, to, uh, to fellowship and touching right now, but to teaching and then uh, prayer and last thing is communion. And he breaks apart scriptures and he's very illustrative as well. And again, they're very short clips. So rather than me coming up here and doing a full-on sermon on these things, I'm going to allow him to go into part uh, five and six of the seven-part series. And so what I did for some of us that missed a couple weeks, we put together this quick little overview. So it's a seven-minute overview of the entire series and then small snippets of each piece to bring us to where we're at today. So if you haven't seen the other, the other video and you want to see them, please email me and I'll email them to you. Because um, they're copyrighted, so we really can't post them on YouTube or something like that. But I, I called and I got the, the yes, it's okay to email to somebody, uh, but you just can't post it on YouTube, okay? So they gave us, they gave me the okay. And before we do that, um, if I can ask you guys during the videos, please don't talk to each other, don't distract each other, because each word is so crucial in the videos. You know, I watched them probably from four to seven times per video, and I'm like, man, there's just so much depth for each thing. Each word's crucial. So I can ask you guys to please just focus on what he's saying. It's really illustrative as well. It's not boring. I promise you that. It's actually pretty uh, drawing. Um, but the first one that we're going to watch tonight um, is, again, about teaching. But before we do that, I want to ask Ava to please just play, if you can, the overview. And, and we're going to stop it at fellowship where we left off last week, okay? the church look like today if we really stopped taking control of it and let the Holy Spirit lead. I 
never understood something until later on in my life. God doesn't want me to do this by myself. He, he, he doesn't want me just to follow him on my own. That's why he created church, the church. I understand that what we're talking about is a huge commitment, but I believe that in your heart, just like it's in my heart, we want to do it because we just don't want to come to the end of our lives and realize that we were playing a game. issues that you see in scripture is is this idea of the fear of God and, and and when when people came in contact with this God it didn't look like just a respect or an awe it sure appears that they are terrified I'm just saying this is just reality the reality is Whoever you are, the moment you see God, you are going to fear Him. We all will. Jesus says to his disciples is follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Last thing he says is go, go and, and, and make these disciples, these, 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 these people who follow me. And in between those two statements, he spent a lifetime of showing them what it means to follow God, showing them what it means to, to, to make disciples or to, to, to fish for men. Then he goes, now go and do the same thing. Where it gets weird is that nowadays, there are millions of people on this earth who call themselves followers of Jesus, but their lives look nothing like his. And yet in their hearts they're convinced they're followers. Maybe the biggest concern with the church today is this apparent lack of the Holy Spirit's power. I mean, when you read the New Testament, you see that the Holy Spirit was supposed to change everything. When Jesus was on the earth, he was getting ready to die and he gathers his disciples together and Jesus says, don't worry because I'm gonna send someone else. In fact, this is going to be to your advantage. It's better than having me on the earth. Now jump forward a couple thousand years. Now, you go to a building, you sit in a chair, you sing a few songs, a guy delivers maybe a polished message, maybe not. You go home. Isn't it the same Holy Spirit that's supposed to be available to us today? Why is it so different? But don't you see, this is what God wants today. I never understood something until later on in my life. As I read in the scriptures, I realized God doesn't want me to do this by myself. He, he, he doesn't want me just to follow him on my own. That's why he created church, the church. We now, before God, should have a fellowship together, a sharing, 
not just of thoughts, ideas, but a sharing of everything to really care for one another. And the question is, is do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to have this sharing, this fellowship that God intended for his church? Or do you want to continue living in isolation? Many years, probably, probably the past three or four years, that's not meant to you guys, but this past for myself, the past three or four years, I've been thinking, you know, there's so much more than just going to a church. You know, like, I'll go to a church, I'll, I'll get a good service, it feels good, I, I walk out on fire for a moment, and slowly but surely, things just die. You know, that fire gets quenched, or I'm so focused on work, or something happens in the family that I kind of lose where God's calling me to do, or there's this fear of really acting out or doing what God's calling me to do. And so, I kind of been feeling like, you know, God, there's so much more, there's so much more. And so, as we have that by one being created, I'm like, God, I want to really be the church. You know, how can I let others know to be the, that we are the church, that the Holy Spirit back then is the same spirit today for God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, but how can I be the church to the world? God says that my Holy Spirit is inside of you now that you are the temple and we are the body, the church. And so for some time, oh my God, you know, this, I feel like there's so much more to do. And so all I can do is, is say, you know, how do my counselors or, or my pastors, how do they run a church? You know, what what can I, you know, God, my God, show me what I can do, what I, you know, what I shouldn't do. And it's like this whole time is God just molding me, as he is every pastor, as he is every teacher, every leader, every husband, every wife, until the day we die. And I'm like, man, there's just so much there's a hunger inside of us. And so I think each one of us, as we just have this drive or this purpose, say, you know what, God, I want to do so much more. And all of a sudden, something happens and you kind of don't do it. Maybe there's fear or there's sin in your life or something happens. You kind of just kind of separate or you feel distant. Now there's this big void. You get depression or there's nothing in life satisfies you. The lack of joy or lack of, of, of this true peace and happiness in life. And so God's saying, just come to me. Just come to me. Just repent and just move forward. And then we get this purpose again in our life. We start walking forward in that direction. And all of a sudden, something happens again. And so after watching this video, I'm like, you know, God, there's so much more. You're just bringing to me is so much more. And like, I just want people to understand it. I mean, what, what, what matters most foremost to me is not what you think, but it's what God thinks. And so in my life, I'm just like, you know, God, I can't worry what other things because you matter most. And, and I, I, have to, I have to tell you, you know, there's, there's times in my life where I just feel God's presence so strong. It's like I feel invincible. And I'm like, I don't care if so and this happens. Or, I mean, obviously I care, but like, I don't care if my life crumbles. I'm like, God's in control of it. And there's moments where I'm like, I'm like hold on, don't hold on. Like, I'm trying to hold on to the things of the world. I'm like, hold on, well, I can't really let go of that. I really can't let go of this person that means too much to me, or I really can't let go of this position or this job. You know, even though I know that you're calling me away from it. And we kind of find ways to justify it in ourselves, and next thing you know, we're back in the same rut, and we're feeling this and again, and we're feeling like, okay, life this is going circles. Because deep down, each one of us has this, has this, this missing hole. And the only person, the only thing that can truly fill that hole is, that, is a life that's surrendered to Christ. And every time that we move away from it, we're struggling. And so it comes down to the very first point is, is fearing God. It's to understand what it means to truly fear God. Now, there's this big movement saying, hey, we, oh, we don't have to fear God. You know, just forget about that. We have Christ. We have grace. And that's true, we do. But there's this big movement saying that, hey, right now, if, G if, if God appeared right here in His holiness, I guarantee you're going to say, oh my gosh, I'm so unholy. You're going to fall down. You're going to fall on your face. And so proper understanding of what it means to follow Jesus is to have the proper understanding of what it means to fear God first. You see, the greatest people in Scripture, the most holiest men that we know, Isaiah, 
when he's there, he had a small glimpse of God. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm dead. I'm dead. Forgive me. Because I just saw the creator. And God says, he comes down, gets the coal, rubs it on his lips, says, your sins are forgiven. And God says, who will I call? He goes, call me, Lord. I will do it. And Apostle John, after he, after he walked with Christ for so many years, he has a revelation. And he sees Christ in his throne. He just falls down as if he's dead. And, and Christ goes, don't worry, it's me. Do not fear. Do not fear. You see, having the proper fear of God is super crucial in our life, each one of our life. And a lot of us, we're not taught what it really means to fear God. And it's only when you have that true fear of God, you will really understand what it means to truly follow and to live for Christ because we realize no, nothing else matters. The Bible is very clear. It says this. It says this. But do not fear the one that can kill your flesh or murder your flesh, but fear the one that can kill your flesh and your soul for all eternity. Don't fear man. Don't fear anything. But fear the one that could damn your soul for all eternity. That's a wake-up call. There's a moment in my life when I was asked a question, they said, Abe, hey, if today you took your last breath, do you know without a doubt that you'll be in heaven? I said, I think so. I think so. I mean, I'm a good person. I believe in Jesus. But my life wasn't surrendered to Christ. And I'm like, you know, thank God that I said, you know what? Oh my gosh, Lord. What matters most in this life is that I know without a doubt that I will be with you when this life ends. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And I want to see my loved ones also be there as well. And I will do whatever it takes. And yeah, you know what? I, I, I walk 10 steps forward. I walk a couple steps backward. And I go through these trials in my life. And... And through it all, my God, I'm so sorry, forgive me, but I realize, I'm like, man, if, it, if these storms didn't happen in my life, I wouldn't be who I am today. I look back and I'm like, God, thank you for those storms. Thank you. But it's having this true fear of God. And once you have that fear of God, God says, fear not. I'm with you. Fear not now. The creator, think about it for a second, the creator of the universe, just think for a minute, the creator of the universe lives inside of you. Do you understand that? God the creator says that my spirit will live inside of you. But a lot of us, we don't truly understand that because we're never taught it. We're not reading the scriptures. Because we're not being devoted to understanding who, who the Holy Spirit really is in our life. And then so as we get to that point in our life, we're like, you know what? He goes, fear not. He goes, you are my child now. He goes, you are my family. He goes, you are my friend. He goes, you are my bride. You are my bride. And God's on our side. Amen? Amen. And he goes, all I want you to do is to do my will. Just do my will. And my will that I have for you is not to say, hey, you can't do this, you can't go party, you can't go club. He goes, he goes, the will that I have for you is to protect you. To give you true life. Goes, and you should avoid these things in life. Why? Because they're going to harm you. They're going to hurt you. And then at times, my, my God will, then how should I live? I mean, you're so holy, I can't know you the way I want to know you. So how should I live? God says, well, you know what? Then I will come down in man's flesh, and I will show you the perfect example of how you should live. And so part two, two was to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. <coughs> Jesus Christ is our perfect example. It's God manifested in flesh to show us, to die for our sins first and foremost, and to show us how to live, living a life saying, God, not my will, but your will be done. And the church has messed it up so badly, you guys. It's been so watered down because it's this big faith movement. You name it, you proclaim it, it's yours. You know, that's not how it works. God says, listen, my will be done, not your will. And he goes, that, he said, all things are possible. And the part with all things that are possible, 
That part is talking about, hey, no matter what suffering you go through for my will, no matter what, what situation you have or circumstance that you have in your life, because you will have the possibility to endure it. That's the possibility. And so we have to make something pretending that God's our genie. And Jesus Christ is saying, listen, he goes, he goes, pass this cup for me, but not my will, but your will be done. Because all that matters, Lord, is that I'm in your will. All that matters, Lord, is that the people that are around me are going to see a light, they're going to see a life devoted, they're going to see the joy that I have and want more of you. More of you. And then we realize that it's very hard to follow Jesus. Do you guys agree? We have struggles in life. You know, we have work, we have family, we have relationships. We just, where we have, wake up in the one morning, there's a bad mood. I mean, I do that once, a, once every other day. <laughs> I'm like, I'm waking up not feeling like the greatest, you know? And I always say it's my allergy. But your mom said every day. Oh, oh, every day, right? <laughs> so, thanks, mom. I'm joking. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, it's very difficult at times to follow Jesus. And to be honest, Christ says, listen, I'm going to be transparent and honest with you. It's not easy. Because you're going to have to carry your cross. Because you're going to have to love in everyone less than me. Put me first before even your own wife, your own kids, for everything else. Because and you may end up being crucified on that cross for my name's sake. He goes, it's not going to be easy. But he says it will be worth it. Because I promise you, it will so be worth it. And a lot of us, we want to believe it, but we just don't trust it. You know, we see, if we saw Christ appear right here and said to you, hey, follow me, without a doubt you would do it. It's just the lack of faith that we have. You know that, hey, how much is God really involved in this? And a lot of time you're looking to pastors or leaders or priests in your life to see who's going to give you the right information that you need to give you the faith you need. But God's saying, you're looking at the wrong person. Look at the wrong person. And so because it's so hard, the, the next one that we saw was called Holy Spirit. And God says, I'm going to give you something even greater to help you with your struggle. And that's the Holy Spirit. And He will empower you. He'll give you the things that you thought you couldn't do. He will change from the inside out. Right? Because, well, you know, to be honest, there's times in my life where I'm like, I still desire this, God. And I know it's wrong, but I still and I'm like, God, I can't change it. I need you to change it. And I'll say, God, just change me, Lord. Just change from the inside out. Change my desire. Change my hunger for the things of the world to the things of you. There's a song by Jeremy Camp that says, Empty me. Just burn away the things that are not of you. And impart in me the things that are of you. Because to be honest, guys, it's so, no one in their right mind can live a life after Christ unless you have the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says that, hey, you know, in, in the Holy Spirit, the, the goal of the Spirit is to change you, to empower you, to give you true power. But number two is to unite the church. And that's difficult. I can get along with most of you guys here pretty well, but there's some of you here, we have different personalities, right? And, and it's very difficult for us to have certain uniting between certain people. And to be honest, only the, only, only the Holy Spirit can do that. And God's saying that, that the church is so divided, that there's, we feel so weak, People look at the Christians and say, wow, you guys are following God. This is how you're living. You're so divided. Most people that I speak to that are not believers say, you know what? How can I follow Christ when there's so much division amongst your own self? I'm like, you're right. You're right. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit to say, God, change me or change them. But Lord, help me. And it's the same thing when it comes to America. You know, you have two sinful people coming together as one. And they may have issues. You may have different issues. And you're trying to 
figure out, okay, I can compromise here and there, but there are certain things that she can probably do that will just, man, you know you want to strangle this person, right? <laughs> but you're like, God, you know what, Lord? Give me the strength to be the stronger vessel in this area. If she has a hard time with patience, then give me the patience I need. And so the ultimate goal is to help grow each other. And that's the point of fellowship. God's saying, listen, that you need the Holy Spirit to grow into fellowship. And then the core thing of fellowship, which is this core, which we just passed last week, was, was really to develop that oneness and to encourage each other and to give our absolute best to each other and to be Christ to each other. And, and to talk about God's Word and to grow each other and, hey, someone's fallen, pick them back up and love them. And I'm telling you, it is difficult. <laughs> And so God said that you're supposed to use that you need the Holy Spirit. And so now, going into this next video that we're going to watch right now, so this is called the teaching, about the teaching. And so you're going to see the, the three people finally come together and fellowship and try to walk with the Holy Spirit, in a sense, or a guide. Don't know if the guide's supposed to be Jesus or Peter or just someone. But we'll see that in a minute. But the last part was fellowship, and now we're going to teaching. So as we are fellowshipping, we should be teaching each other, growing each other, learning from each other, and becoming more and more like Christ. Not just having a barbecue, not just being together, but really having Christ centered as a part of the fellowship, and the heart of fellowship. Do you agree? Amen. So this is teaching, and uh, just please, if I can ask you again, no distractions, uh, you can time to talk, stay focused. Again, each word is pretty crucial, so we'll watch the video right now. Hey, what are you? started attending church gatherings, I still remember people would encourage me and say, okay, you need to read the Bible. You got to read this thing. And you, you should read it every day, read it in the morning. And, and, and I still remember trying that. I, I would just force myself and discipline myself and get up early and start reading this book. And, and I'm so glad I did. I mean, in hindsight, I'm so glad that, that I had this base of knowledge and I began to read for myself and understand the book for myself. But as I would read it, I would notice that there was something different about the way they studied the scriptures and the way I was doing it. It says in the Bible that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And, and the other thing I would notice in the Bible is it seemed much more natural to them. In fact, in 1 Peter it says they, to, to crave it, to desire it. It wasn't force yourself, discipline. I mean, that's in there, there's some of that, but it was this natural craving. He says like a newborn baby would crave milk. He said, so we should desire the Word of God. And I remember when my, my first child was born, it was almost eerie. It, it was, it really was strange. Like the moment she was born, she immediately wanted milk. It, it just happened. It was natural. And what the Bible says is, is there ought to be this natural craving when it comes to the Bible. Not just a discipline, not just a forced thing, but to want it. And when I read the early believers and, and, and the way they lived, it's, it was so natural for them. And, and it makes sense. It makes sense because, look, Jesus told them, I want you to teach everyone to obey me. I, I want you to teach them to obey everything I commanded. Not all those people had the privilege of hanging out with Jesus all of those years and hearing everything they taught, so they immediately went to the apostles. They immediately went to Peter and said, hey Peter, what did he teach? What did he teach? Because he wants us to be obedient and I got to teach other people. John, tell me, what did he teach? What did he say? And they devoted themselves to these people who actually walked with Jesus. 
And when you think about it, it's really no different for us today. Why? Because it's the mission. I I'm supposed to teach other people what Jesus taught, so I need to go to those who are actually eyewitnesses. Peter, he explains that he was an eyewitness. In 2 Peter 1, verse 16, he says, we didn't follow cleverly designed myths when we made known to you the power and commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Describing this time, it talks about in Matthew 17, when Peter actually went up on this mountain. It was him, James, John, and Jesus. And it says when they got up there, Jesus starts to transfigure before them. He transforms into this other being. It says that his face starts shining like the sun. His whole body starts glowing. And, and the disciples are terrified by this because it says these two heavenly beings come out of heaven and he starts talking with them. And then suddenly this cloud envelops the whole place. And it says it's this bright cloud. And they would have known. They would have known the Old Testament. The Old Testament talks about this glory cloud that the Israelites used to follow. It represented the presence of God. So when that cloud starts coming and now it envelops them and then they hear a voice coming out of the cloud they knew who was talking it was God they were about to hear God's voice and God says this is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased listen to him see when I first started reading the Bible I just read it for information almost, just to know more stuff rather than treating it as the words of God, like coming off of that mountain, coming out of that cloud, trembling at his word. It's so important to understand what we mean when we say the word of God. Unfortunately, we live in a time when so many of the church are running after opinions. Like they want to know, what does this person think? What does that person think? Forget about it. Look at this book. What does God say? It doesn't matter what people think. God's word is so much the authority of the church, and it has to be, or we're going to ruin this. Now, 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 the early church, they had the apostles. They had those teachers. They knew who to run to, but, but what about today? I mean, who do you and I listen to? And again, the Bible gives us that instruction. If anyone speaks to you, anyone, I don't care who they are and how great a teacher they claim to be, look into the word. Because if they contradict this, the Bible says, let them be accursed. Paul says, I don't care if an angel from heaven comes down and teaches you something different from what is written. This is the standard. The book is the standard. So we study and we look and we study with each other and go, man, is this person's teachings, are, are, are those really biblical? And if so, we can keep following them. And pretty soon you're going to start figuring out who knows the Bible better. You'll understand because the Bible says that the Spirit will gift people in certain ways to where some will have this gift of teaching. And so you'll naturally start to follow them. It's kind of like this one time, uh, one of our staff guys goes, hey, let's, let's go play football. And so a bunch of us staff, we went out and played football, but no one knew what anyone could do because we'd never played football together. So we split up in teams and, and, and I remember this one guy, Tony, he, he always goes, I, I should be quarterback. And we're like, okay, Tony, you can be quarterback. 
but he can only throw it like 10 yards. You know, so Ray Stevens like, ah, why don't you uh, go get us some water, you know, or go block or do something else. But you're not the quarterback. I mean, pretty soon we just figured out, wow, you're fast. You should be the receiver. You should be the quarterback. You just figured out. And the Bible says that in the church context, God's going to give every church exactly what they need. There'll be those teachers, there'll be people with gifts of encouragement, but you, you figure it out that way, you will, you'll know, because as we all study the Bible, there are gonna be people, people who just teach better than others. We're all called to teach. So if you read something in the Bible, what you're called to do is pass that on to someone else. And it's not just about head knowledge, the Bible says, and it warns over and over again, it warns against false teachers. And sometimes it was because they were teaching things that were false, but other times it's because of their lifestyles. Paul says, look, there'll be people who will teach for the sake of greed or for the sake of ego. There'll be all these other things. He says, so watch their lives. Do they look like Jesus? Do they act like Jesus? We had this speaker at our church one time. He, he was a missionary out in Papua New Guinea, and he lived in the jungles for like 20 years and translated the Bible, the New Testament, into their language. And amazing life. But he talks about how in the end, he was so influenced by his youth pastor, this guy named Vaughn. And what's crazy about it is the next week, we had another speaker who was telling us to, to sponsor these kids who were hungry, they're starving, and he explained how he started on this, this type of lifestyle because of the influence of his youth pastor, Vaughn. And it was the same guy. And, and I remember talking to my friend Dan about it. I go, isn't that weird? They both talked about the same guy. And he goes, oh, I know Pastor Vaughn also. I'm like, seriously? He goes, yeah, I was in Mexico with Vaughn one time. And he talks about this story where, where he and Vaughn were walking around the dumps in Tijuana and these kids that were just so desperate for food or, or clothing or whatever, they, they, they just knew to come running to, to Vaughn because he went there regularly and he'd give them clothes and he would care for them and hug them and love them. And, and people would just come from these different villages and they, they, they just knew that Vaughn was this man of love. And the thing was, was, was Dan said, the whole time I was walking with Vaughn, I thought to myself, I think this is what it would have felt like to walk with Jesus. Like if Jesus was on the earth, this is what it would feel like. And he looks at me and he goes, he goes, it was almost eerie. He goes, Francis, the day I spent with Vaughn is the closest thing I've experienced on this earth to walking with Jesus. See, it's not just about knowing the words of Jesus, it's about actually becoming like him. And so as we seek teachers, it's not just those who have the knowledge, but those who live it out. That's why Paul tells Timothy, look, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Don't just pay attention to what you're saying, look at how you live. 
And again, look at the people you follow. Are they not only teaching the words of God, but are they living it out? And, 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 and understand that your job is not to just wait until someone like that shows up. We all have a responsibility to study and we also all have a responsibility to teach. Jesus didn't say, hey, get people to these gatherings and then have your pastor disciple them. See, that's where we've had it so wrong in the church. God puts that burden on all of us. He says, you learn the scriptures and you teach the scriptures and you live the scriptures and then you teach other people to do the same thing. You make disciples. It's a beautiful thing that God has entrusted all of us. These are the very words of God. These are what the prophets have said for centuries, what people have given their lives for. The Bible says that, that it's the church that's supposed to be the pillar of truth. It means we hold it up, and the moment we stop doing that, everything falls apart. We're called to hold these sacred writings and to pass them on. And too many people are gathering over opinions and thoughts and feelings. We've got to get back to teaching the Bible and holding it sacred as we fellowship Let's center everything on God's words.
these certain key things that he thinks people will, that were important for that moment. I mean, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, like people will try to use their scholarly intellect to say, hey, look, well, in Hebrew or in Greek, it says this, and it can mean this, and they somehow try to form like, the scriptures to fit their life. And so we see the world somehow infiltrating into the Bible in a sense and bringing out this new method of preaching that is so far off from truth. And Apostle Paul says, hey, listen, you know, we're called to be like the Bereans. And the Bereans were a certain group that every time something was said, they would search the scriptures and double check what's being said and double check it. You know, we're called to study the scriptures daily. And if we're not, we're so easily, can we easily be influenced and pushed away, like we saw in the video. Like, it just sounds so enticing. Very nice. You know, we're constantly being marketed 24-7. Constantly. From TV to media, from music, to sex, power, position. And mostly, everything is just drawing us away from God. Majority of things are drawing us away from God, and it's like a, a frog in a pan. You know, when you put the heat on, they don't realize how hot it's getting. They actually end up dying in the pan. They never move. Frogs, they 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 acclimate so slowly to the heat that they don't realize that it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And so, for us being born in this day and age, like it's it's like this is normal for. And then as the world's constantly changing, it's so subtle that we don't realize that we're actually being drawn away. And so we have to fight much harder against the world and to be in the scripture and to be continually aware of what's happening and to be a light to others. Because we will also be cooked in the frying pan if we don't make ourselves aware of what's happening in this world. And so good teaching is super important. And that means you too have to be that teacher for your child, for your brother, for your sister, for your parents, for your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, whatever it is in this church of scriptures. Not just once a week or twice a week on a Wednesday. Um, and, and this is kind of the thought I had, you know, like, I was just visualizing as what was watching this video, I'm like, you know, what if right now Christ appeared somewhere in this room and he called, let's say Fred, said, Fred, come here, I want to tell you something. And he comes and he tells Fred something like in secret almost. And it's like, you know, right when Christ disappears and you see Fred, it's like, we will do all we can and say, Fred, what did Christ say? You know, tell us what he said. And that's the hunger these people had. And God's saying, listen, you have exactly that in your hands. And these scriptures, these are the eyewitnesses that actually saw and spoke with Christ. And they actually are speaking to you. And so when we're reading the Bible, it's like, man, this is God's word speaking to me. It's not just for me to study and gain knowledge, but to me to live a life that's truly devoted. That's what it means to truly be devoted to Christ. You know, this... What, if you have Bible hand, that's what that's what that's the word of God right there. As if Christ appeared, told somebody something, I and mean, now you're you're actually listening to what he said. But most of us have a, a Bible on our table and it's collecting dust and it's just there, or hey, I'm a believer, it's in your bookshelf. But it's hardly open. It's hardly open. Don't let me put the guilt on you. That just be truthful. Right? God bless me. Exactly. Right. So with that handout, if you can, you know, probably take about a good solid hour, maybe, like an hour and a half, to, to look through it. Maybe ten minutes just to, to read during a lunch break or something. Just kind of reflect. But take some time and go into it. It'll be great. I don't want to do it in vain, all that work. But hopefully it comes out well. But this next video is about prayer. And as you saw just now in the end, they kind of were fellowshipping and they kind of left their guide for a minute and they came to an edge and they got lost and now they're looking back and saying oh shoot where am I why am I so far away and so this is this is the one video I got to say this whole thing spoke to me but this one particular video actually broke me 
it's like I'm like you know just I actually get in tears just because of my life and just how I've lived how I've lived and like only until recently and like in even this Pastor Francis Chan here you know when he was talking about it and he was saying that how recently for him as well I'm like just, like he just realized what it really means to pray and I'm like you know God you know like, like forgive me for ever thinking differently and like for so many years I've been you know yeah, we know, but there's just so much death. And I'm like, God, this is like a joy and like a cry at the same time. I'm like, I needed to hear this. I watched it over and over for myself, not for you, to be honest, for at first. But I'm like, man, I needed to hear this. And again, I'm not trying to amp this up, but hopefully it portrays what I'm saying. But it's just that it just really was so deep for me. Um, Maybe it was emotional, but they're not going to watch it though. Okay. Uh, but if, if, if I can, if I can, uh, again, I'm saying, so please, if you can, there's no distractions. I know, mean, like, we're going to probably say, oh, that's true, and then it's so quiet, it's to, to distraction. So if you have to use the restrooms and now, the coffee, quick, or water, get it now. Um, we'll take the video. Um, so I'm going to ask you to just to slowly raise the volume a little bit, if you don't mind. But this is going to be the last video, and then we're going to close in prayer, and we're going to, I'm going to ask you guys to do, to, to do something slightly different afterwards. We'll get a handout out as well, and we'll pray. But hopefully, um, if you are new, if you're just coming, or if you've been out for a bit, you know, just, we're in the Gospel of Mark, that's where we're at. We're going verse by verse, and we're taking them apart, and letting the Scriptures interpret itself, and illustrating it. But before I get to this last part, to kind of illustrate what's happening is that we're naturally born. And this is the world on this side, this is God on this side. We're naturally born with sin. We're naturally born craving the things of the world and not wanting to be under God's law. We come to a point of fear in our life and saying, man, my life is empty. There's something, there's so much more. There's a creator. And you realize, man, eternity exists, whatever it is. And you get this fear. And you're like, oh my gosh, there's something in the afterlife. And you have this revelation of God. Now there's this fear in you. And all of a sudden, you become this child of God. God says, listen, I'm with you. Now you're kind of turning and you're fighting the world in a sense. You're turning around and you're following God. And you're going against the world. You're going almost like you're going uphill or you're going or something upstream. And it's a struggle. And God says, listen, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit to have you do the things that you thought you couldn't. And now you're having this Holy Spirit, and at times you're falling and getting beaten up. All of a sudden you see all the others fellowshipping, coming together, giving you the strength and the encouragement you need to move and walk this walk. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so we're walking this walk, and hopefully we're bringing others with us, being the church. And at the same time, we're learning to say, you know what, what's the proper teaching? And we're helping each other grow and being taught properly. And now we're going to pray. Pray. The depth of what it really means to pray. Hey, Lord, get started. Thanks. Have you ever prayed and then experienced an undeniably supernatural response? Where you go, okay, I know someone up there heard me because that couldn't have been coincidence. Have you ever done that? You ever you've just prayed for something so specific and the answer blows your mind and there's no one that can tell you that no one was listening because you saw it, you experienced it. And once you experience that, there, there's nothing like it in life. It's an amazing feeling. You understand why that early church devoted themselves to prayer. If you're given a mission, that really is impossible. I mean, you're telling this small group of people, Jesus commands a small group of people, I want you to get this message 
to the ends of the earth. You have to be looking at each other going, how in the world do we do that? I mean, remember, this is 2,000 years ago. And to get this message to the rest of the world, they go, okay, God, you're gonna have to do this for us. And so they devoted themselves to this prayer. And, and when, I, when I look at the way they, they prayed, I, I see it as pretty different from the way I was taught to pray because when I was first taught, people just said, hey, just, just start talking. Just say whatever comes to your mind. And, and so I did. I would just start opening my mouth and talk to God about whatever. And, and there's some truth to that, but I noticed in the Bible, there are also some warnings that we have to be very careful how we approach God. For example, Ecclesiastes 5 says, guard yourselves. It says, guard your steps when you go near to the house of God. And it says, draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they're doing evil. Don't just go and start talking. Come silently, come slowly, be careful. And see, these are the things that no one ever told me. They didn't say, hey, be careful what you say to God. Don't make all these empty promises. And yet you have in Ecclesiastes 5 saying, you better be careful what you say. Otherwise, God will destroy the work of your hands if you make these promises you don't keep. And, and as I studied scripture more and more, I realized very few people taught me how to pray in church. And very few people warned me and they didn't even explain to me that God doesn't always listen. You gotta be careful what you say. In fact, James 4 says a lot of times you'll ask and you don't receive because what you're asking for, you're asking to spend on your own passions. Well, no one warned me about that. I thought you just ask him for anything, say anything. You know, he's like a big genie up there. As I look at the way the disciples prayed back then, and as I look at the way Jesus taught us to pray, I, I, I realize it's a lot different from what I was taught. Prayer to them was, was really different. They asked for things that was different from what I typically asked for. And so the last few years have, have, has been a process of really just understanding prayer again. I remember growing up in this, uh, this little Chinese church and uh, and they, they, they taught us how to pray the Lord's Prayer in Chinese. And, and my prayer, my, my Chinese isn't real good, but you know, they, they made us memorize this. And it was almost like a competition, you know, me and my little Chinese buddies were trying to figure out who can memorize it. So every week we learn a phrase and, and pretty soon we got it. It's like, you know, we would just say this thing and, go, and have no clue what we're saying. I mean, what's a glum? I have no clue. I still don't know. It was just this thing we memorized and we said it and we said the Lord's Prayer and no one knew what we were talking about. And I think, I still don't know what those words mean. It, you know, I, I had no clue what I was saying back then, but I, I said it really fast and I, you know, and I, and I, and I beat some of my friends and, and, and is that really what God intended? But, but what's amazing is years later, I learned it in English. I learned the Lord's Prayer in English and it wasn't until a few years ago that I realized, wow, I don't even know what I was saying in English. I never really thought through the phrase, and, and maybe you haven't either. I, I, mean, I mean, think about it. The very first word when we say, our Father who art in heaven, just that word, our. Did you ever think that you were praying, our Father? And, and how we say, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debt. It, it's, it's all about us. I never thought about prayer as something we were supposed to do together. They never taught me that, that it was something about our fellowship and this group, this gathering coming before God and saying, our dad. I was taught to pray this in isolation. In fact, some of my friends tell me that they were told to pray it as, as a punishment for some of the things that they did wrong. Hey, say say a bunch of our fathers. And, 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 and we, we lose the thought of this community, this group of people coming together before their father in heaven. And here we are on this little planet addressing him. And it says, hallowed be thy name. That word hallowed meant sacred. Like your name is so sacred, God. It's, it's an honor to even speak to you. It's an, even, it's an honor to even address you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
think about these phrases now that we've been saying for years and maybe we didn't mean. I mean, we, we, we used to say, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. We're asking for our daily provision. I don't know that I've ever had to pray this um, because I've lived with so much for so much of my life. But think about that phrase, you're saying, God, give us this day our daily bread. Just give me enough to get me through this day. The truth is, is I think if God just gave us our daily bread, many of us would be angry. Many of you, like, that's all you're gonna give me? You're just gonna give me enough to sustain me for today? What about tomorrow or, or next year or 10, 20, 30 years from now? I wanna know that I'm set up. And yet Jesus, now just, just pray for your daily provisions. I've prayed, lead me not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation. Haven't you prayed that at times in your life when you actually still were holding on to some temptation? Maybe you weren't even ready to let go of all of your sin, and yet you're saying, it's, it's like your words weren't matching up to your heart. And the one that scares me is, is when we say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We're saying, God, forgive me in the same way as I have forgiven others. That scares me because I know I've prayed that while being angry at other people. I know I've prayed that prayer while I was still unforgiving. And so now when I'm telling God, God, forgive me in the same way as I forgive other people. See, we, we need to be warned about this stuff. We shouldn't be just making these vows to God and saying things we don't understand. I never understood, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I, I didn't get that. I mean, have you ever really thought that through? It was just a few years ago that I thought, wow, what was I asking for? I was saying, thy kingdom come. What we're saying is, God, I want your kingdom. I, I want, it's, it's, it's like the, the, the Great Commission where he says, you go and you teach people to obey everything I commanded. We're saying, God, that's what we want. We want you to rule. We want your reign. We want your kingdom. We want everyone to obey you. You know, it's like in heaven, you know, you've, you're on your throne and, and the angels and everyone's following you. We want that here on earth. See, when you pray, is your desire the same desire as God's? Are you after this kingdom? Are you after this mission? Or are you after your own kingdom? So often when we pray, it sounds more like, my kingdom come, my will be done on this earth. I want what I want. Unlike what Jesus says, where Jesus says, hey, not my will, but yours be done. And, and when Jesus taught us to pray, he says, when you pray, pray in my name. And so what we do is at the end of our prayers, we'll tack on, oh, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. We'll say, God, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Guys, that's not what he meant. He didn't mean tack that on at the end of your selfish prayer. He said, no, when you pray in Jesus' name, it's like I am praying for the things that Jesus wanted, the things that he cared about. It was about his mission. We have to check ourselves and go, am I concerned about the things of God? Because so often when we pray, it's just about ourselves. I've made a lot of mistakes in prayer. Uh, a lot of times in church, prayer became like a transition thing where, okay, pray there because then we're gonna have the band come up while everyone's got their head down. You know, it became like this convenience rather than a bunch of people really coming in the presence of God. The beautiful thing is I, I thank God he's a God of grace and he heard all those prayers I prayed in ignorance and he forgives me. But what I get excited about is what if we did pray the right way? I mean, imagine this. What if you got together with a group of people 
and you knew that this group of people, they all loved God, they all feared Him, and they really were living for God's kingdom and for His mission. And imagine if you came collectively with people that you've sacrificed with, you've sacrificed for, this is a family, and you come united and you all pray together and say, Our Father, you've seen our lives. You know that we care about your kingdom. We want your kingdom here. We want you to change us. We want you to change the people around us. Can you imagine praying with that type of unity? What the Bible says is, God is looking for people like that. Second Chronicles uh, chapter 16, verse nine says, the eyes of the Lord, they're, they're roaming to and fro throughout the earth. He's actually looking for people who are committed to him. Why? Because he wants to strengthen them. I love this, God wants to answer our prayers. It's not like we're asking him to do something he's reluctant to do. He's looking for people and I keep thinking, and can you imagine God sitting on his throne and seeing you and a group of your friends praying the way he asked you to pray and praying for the things that he cares about? I, I gotta believe that if we did that, he's longing to hear that. He's longing to show off his power. But maybe we haven't seen it. Maybe we haven't seen his power because we haven't been praying for the things that he wanted us to pray for. See, when we pray like that, and we really mean it, I really believe that's when we'll see the supernatural, just like the apostles did. And when we see those types of answers, prayer will no longer be a ritual or a time of transition, a way to end a service or a way to uh, bless a meal, but it'll be a way of life. Isn't there a beauty as you hear that? Of what if? and then to see him answer your prayers, it wouldn't be a chore. It'd be what you would live for.
while Fred's up here. You know, I yes, I'm accountable in the sense that I'm clear that to my family and friends, but when I stand before God, it's me alone before God. Nobody else, as far as my accountability. And I don't want to come to the end of the road and say, you know what, I wish I was different. I wish I was, I wish I lived different. But we can pray for others. Yeah, we're called to pray for each other, yes, but I can't pray for God to forgive you of your sins. I can't pray for God to forgive the sinner for his sins because that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is saying, God, forgive me, like, I'm wrong, you're right, and I'm going to turn from my sin and turn to you. So I can't impart that into you. That has to be your heart, your confession before God. I can't pray for your forgiveness. I'm praying that God changes your heart. I'm praying that God brings people to you. I'm praying for your protection. I'm praying that God is, is constantly just trying to change your heart and show himself to you and to open up your eyes to truth. But it's up to you. Remember when that Jesus when he first found the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, let them know what they're doing? Yes. He asked God to forgive them. That's right. And so because of that, he took the sins of the world, right? And those and those who now believe in Jesus have that forgiveness. Right? Jesus says that, hey, listen, when you put your trust in me, all that sin that you've committed is going to fall upon me. I will take the punishment. So you still pray for them to be forgiven. I ask God to forgive myself for my sins, but to also is to give them the right heart to ask for forgiveness. Because I can't make someone a believer of Jesus in their heart. It has to be that person's forgiveness. They have to ask God to forgive me of my sin. And the word forgiveness means it's to make a U-turn, to turn around from your ways and to follow Christ. Does that make sense? Any questions? You can ask them for healing. Of course. Of course. Go ahead. You sure? Sure it makes sense? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, it, it just makes it real. You know, like, hey, this is about relationships. It's about coming together, community, as one, united by the power of the Holy Spirit, and really just following Christ, you know? And if each one of us here has never truly said, God, you know what, like, I really want to surrender my heart. I really desire to have that relationship with you. You know, I look at my life, I'm not living the right way, and I need your help. I, you know, tomorrow is not guaranteed to us. And you know, I'm telling you, God will allow things to happen in your life until you're forced to be on your back and only look up. God desires so much to do whatever it takes to draw you to Him so that when your eyes close that you will be with Him. And so I just want to take the opportunity now to say if we can just bow our heads for a second and just really just ask God between you and God, not between me and you and God. I'm going to be praying for you guys. Just really just say, God, just look at my life if there's anything in my heart, anything in my life that I can just show, reveal to me the things that I need to get rid of, reveal to me the things I need to do, and to give you the strength, just take a minute, and on your own, just pray before God. If there's any sin in your life, just confess it before God. God is able to, to forgive all sin, all sin. I don't care what you've done, what you've what you're doing, what's going on in your life, God will forgive you. Father, tonight as we 
I don't only just bow our heads and bow our hearts before you, God. I pray that your Holy Spirit just truly speaks tonight. That we are not just hearers of your word, but doers of your word, Lord. May as we walk out this place, God, I pray, God, that you just truly just speak to us. May it not be about how things are supposed to be in the church or how there's 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 no stained glass or how there's no candles or how there's nothing, God, how it's not about the appearance of the building, Lord, but it's about the appearance of me, of who my heart is before you. May it be about your Holy Spirit, God, and just allowing you to move in us and to change our hearts to become more like Jesus, God. And I'm going to ask everyone tonight, Lord, as we pray, I'm not even worried about donations, God. I'm just going to ask you, God, as we just come to our feet and maybe just join hands, Lord, and maybe just join hands and may we truly pray the Our Father prayer together with the right heart, with the right attitude. And I'm just going to ask us right now, Lord, just give us the strength and the right heart and the right attitude to really pray before you. May we all stand and join hands. Why don't we join hands in a circle? Let's all face each other if we can. Just join hands. Don't matter. It's okay. This is community. This is what it means. When the early church came together and they prayed together. Look around. Each one of us here who believes in Jesus Christ is your brother and sister. And I'm going to ask you guys to speak or to pray out loud with me. Hopefully some of us know the Our Father prayer. I'm going to actually ask Christine to lead us. If you don't mind. Our Father, if we know it in our language. Sure. However, however you mean it. But I also want you to do this, okay? I want you to realize this moment where Jesus Christ is sitting. He is sitting in his throne room. And but the Bible describes it in Revelation that at this exact moment that Jesus Christ is sitting on his throne and that there's these angels around him and there's and they have six wings and they're covering their eyes, they're covering their feet, and they're flying because he's so holy. And there's like a glass of just ice and lightning and thunder and God and His power. And now right now, and I really mean this, God right now, Jesus Christ is sitting as we are here on His throne. And when we're praying this prayer, to think and to know that, hey, I'm speaking to Jesus. I'm speaking to Jesus and I'm asking our Father to truly be with us. When we pray, when we have that attitude knowing that we're truly speaking to God Himself. Christine, please. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come to you today as a church, as brothers and sisters in Christ, and as your children of your most holy and high God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespassers, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.